I want you to open with me, <coughs> excuse me, to the book of Ephesians, and we're going to go to chapter 6 of the book of Ephesians. So let's go over there, if you will, and, um, and get ourselves in the right chapter. Um, I preached a message similar to this, or taught, however, you, however it comes out, teaching, preaching, I never know. But I taught a message, this message, the title of this message, and some of the verses about a month ago on a Thursday night. And I got so, so many good responses from it. And one, one of the brothers said to me, you know, Pastor, you ought to teach that or speak that on a, on a, a Sunday so the whole church could hear it. And I said, okay. It's really a very basic message. This is not a difficult new revelation. I don't know about you, but I appreciate new revelation, but I'm still trying to really get the old revelation working in my life. I need to hear the old stuff over and over again because that really keeps reassuring and re, uh, reinforcing the foundation upon my, which my faith and my walk in Christ is built. So I appreciate going over this stuff. So anyway, um, tonight, well, uh, tonight, this morning, what we're going to talk, I'm still stuck in last night. That's all right. We, we had a great service last night, a great one this morning. We're, we're, just, we're on a roll. Amen. So the, the title of the message is the weapons of our warfare. How many of you know that we are in a warfare on this earth? Now, I believe, and I, I taught this a, a, about a month ago as well, six weeks ago, we talked about purpose and that God has designed a purpose for every person. And I showed you a verse where it said our days were written in his book before they were ever established or ever were, were ever there, that God had all of our days in that book. God has a plan. How many of you would agree with me that God has a destiny and a plan for your life? I want what God has. But you know, likewise, the enemy has a plan. And the enemy, his plan is to thwart, to upset, to overthrow and negate the plan of God in your life and in my life. I mean, one of the examples I can give you, which is a clear example that we see in the life of Jesus. Jesus came on a mission. Jesus had a destiny. He had a purpose. He came, he, he even declared his purpose. He told those that were following him that I've come, um, that they may have life and have it more abundantly. He came and explained in many, many uh, portions of scripture, we see what his purpose was. But the enemy had a purpose to try to stop him, to get in his way, to thwart and to overthrow the plan of God in his life. Uh, we see that in the desert when Jesus was confronted by the enemy, by the devil. What was the devil trying to do? He was trying to dissuade him, get him off course, try to get him to bow down to him. Thank God that Jesus was wiser and smarter and that Jesus being God, knew exactly what he was dealing with and he laid down a pattern for you and for me and for us in overthrowing the works of darkness. So if you're in pursuit of a dream and a vision and a desire and you're, you're in pursuit of your destiny, the enemy is always going to come to try to mess it up, to try to thwart the plan of God. I know in the course of my life over the years that I've pastored this church that whenever God had something big in store for me, there was always a warfare that came before it. Now, I don't know, that may not be you, but I always seem to have come up against a warfare that I had to fight and win and break through to the other side before I was able to really walk in the fullness of God's plan. I began to see how the enemy was always trying. The enemy tried to stop me from when I was just a young boy. He knew, he knew that the call of God was on my life. He could just see it in my life. Somehow, he's not omniscient. He doesn't see all like God sees and knows all, but he has understanding because he's very crafty in his dealings and his workings with God's people. We cannot be fooled by the devil. So now there are a couple of classifications of people. There are some people that get really upset when you start talking about the devil. Don't give me this devil talk. I don't believe in a devil. Well, that would be the greatest victory for the enemy to get you to believe that he does not exist. Then you become a perfect tool in his hand to execute and to carry out the plans that he has. But then there's a class of people or a group of people who become afraid when you talk about the enemy. And the only reason why you're afraid is, that, I'll tell you what it is, you don't understand the authority and the power and the weapons that you have against the enemy. And then there's that group of people that blames everything on the devil. And I'm gonna tell you right now that, you know, you don't have to blame the devil because you're doing a good enough job screwing things up all by yourself. See, so we understand that, that the enemy has a plan and there's a warfare that we are in 
and we've got to learn how to fight that warfare. So weapons of our warfare. But before we get to the weapons, let's go through some verses. So let's go to Ephesians chapter 6. And let's read through here, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. Who are we supposed to be strong in? The Lord. Not in my strength, but in his strength. Oftentimes, you know, I see people fumbling and having a rough time in life because you're not doing it in the strength of God. You're trying to do it in your own strength. But we're to be strong in the Lord. That's where my strength comes from. He renews my strength. He gives me fresh strength every day as I stay close and connected to him. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Not my might, but his might. And then it goes on to say, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against, listen, stand against the wiles of the devil. I like this word wiles. So I, I like to look up words in my Bible dictionary. So I went back. And I have a bunch of them, and I, I looked up and I found this, and I thought this was powerful. This is the definition from the Bible dictionary, one of them, of what wiles means. It means to work by method. How many of you understand the devil has a method? Actually, to be honest with you, let's be truthful about it. He doesn't really have any new tricks. His method is the same old method that keeps repeating itself over and over. The names change, the faces change, the circumstances change, but the method is always the same old tired out method and we need to become aware of it and begin to use the weapons that God has given us with force and power and faith to destroy the wiles or the methods of the enemy. Can I get a better amen than that? <laughs> so it also means the following, now listen, the following or pursuing of an orderly and technical procedure in the handling of a subject. That means the devil is organized. He actually has an orderly and technical procedure that he unleashes against God's people to try to thwart their future and break and hinder and stop the plan of God in your life and in my life. It's time for us to become aware and to open our eyes. He says an orderly and technical procedure, or this says, in the handling of a subject. And it's always connected with evil doing, a device, an art, an artificial method, craft, or while. That's what it means. So we see just from this definition of what the word while means that Paul is giving us in, in the book of Ephesians is that there is a plan and it is a very craftily worked out plan that the enemy has to try to stop, hinder, harass and to overthrow the work of God in your life. And it's amazing to me how many people that I have encountered in my life are no longer serving and walking with God and really have become neutralized by the enemy because really that is the greatest desire that he has for your life. It's not to put sickness on you. It's not to get you in an accident. You know, people think of those things. Really what it is, is to put you in neutral, to neutralize you. Here it is, to make you ineffective for God. If he can make you ineffective for God, then the whole body of Christ suffers because every time you win, Every time you, you are blessed, every time you increase, the kingdom of God increases and the kingdom of God is blessed and God is glorified by the word of our testimony, by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony, we shall overcome. So we understand that the devil has a plan and we are in this spiritual warfare. So don't close your eyes and become numb to it. Don't be afraid of, oh, this preacher is just a fanatical. Well, you're, you're right. I am fanatical, but I'm preaching the truth from God's word. So let's continue reading. So he says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against. In other words, that's what we're supposed to do. Stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle. Now he's telling you, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. He's pointing out to you that there is a very intricately organized system and hierarchy that the devil has that's in this earth 
principalities, powers over communities, over places that are with, with angels, demon angels that have assignments to go out and harass God's people. And he says, you're not wrestling with flesh and blood. That's, the, that's where the, the devil would love to get us, just fighting with one another and taking the attention off of him. And that's where, that's where the body of Christ so often is so hurt because we get so wrapped up in each other that we forget that we're not the problem. I've had to tell people that in my years of pastoring because, you know, get on me for, you, you, you know, you all think everybody loves me. And I, I thought the same thing when I first got in the ministry. I thought everyone was going to just, oh, they're going to just love me. I mean, I have nothing but love in my heart. All I want to do is help people. Everyone's going to love me. And I soon found out that there wasn't a whole lot of love out there. And you should hear the things people have said to me. And I've had to say to them, you know, I'm not the devil. I, I don't have a plan against you. I'm here to help you. I'm not here to hurt you. I'm not here. I'm here to help you to be and to grow into all that God has for you. But the enemy has a plan and he wants to hinder and harass and stop you in your track. And I see so many people that have been neutralized by the enemy because they fell for the scheme. They fell for the while. And they did not know how or what to do to get out of it. So let's keep reading. So he says, against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. And he tells you, therefore. And one preacher said many years ago, and he said, when there's a therefore, find out what it's there for. <laughs> right? So he tells you that this is the problem. This is the warfare. It's not with people. It's not with your boss. It's not with your mother. It's not with your father. It's, it's not with your neighbors. There's a spiritual force of wickedness that's trying to manipulate your life and trying to thwart the plan of God and trying to harass you. Many, many times, you know, I think I told the testimony many times in this church, the harassment that we received when we tried to build this building. We bought this piece of land here in Westchester County, which is one of the most expensive counties in the country. And we were able to possess and to buy this land. And the minute we claimed this land and we bought this land was the minute the devil unleashed the plan to try to thwart and stop and halt the, uh, the plan of God and the purpose of God for this church and, and for this people. And I'll tell you what, you know, you laugh about it, but I say he summoned every demon in the tri-state area and told him, converge at 1236 Mimaronic Avenue and stop him. Stop that building project. And uh, we had to fight our way through every, but you see, it wasn't people. It wasn't the neighborhood association. It wasn't the government. It wasn't the, 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 the uh, uh, union. It was the plan and the device of the devil. And as long as you get focused on people, you're going to bypass the real problem. As long as you focus on humans, you're going to bypass the real source of the issue in, behind the scenes in your life. And that's what Paul is trying to teach here by saying, you're not wrestling with flesh and blood. You're not wrestling with people. The devil wants you to think you are. The devil wants you to think that the fight is with humans, but the fight is not with humans. The fight is with a absolutely strategically organized system that the devil has in the spirit realm that is trying to control God's people. But thank God that we are wiser than the schemes of the devil. Thank God. Thank God that he may have schemes and he may have tricks and he may have wiles and he may have devices, but get ready. We have weapons of warfare to destroy everything that he would ever try to unleash against us. One of the, one of the great men of God that I encountered some years ago and had the great joy of having him in, in the church was Lester Sumrall. Now, some of you probably don't know, because he lived quite, not quite a while ago, but he, he was um, an older man when I met him, and I was only about 33 when I met him. And he preached in the church a couple times, and I went out to his ministry. And one of the times I had him, I said, Brother Sumrall, you're, you're an older man. You, you, you've been through some. If you were going to give some wisdom to a younger guy like me, what, what wisdom would you give me? And I'm getting ready because I'm thinking he's going to elaborate on some great issue of ministry and, you know, how to handle things or what, you know, some pearl of wisdom. And he looked at me with his bony little finger and he said, fight the devil, son. And I said, that's it. But those words were so powerful 
because I sat back and I, lis I, I listened to those words and I sat back and I thought, here I'm expecting this grandiose dissertation from you know, this older man to this younger minister, this older minister to the younger minister, and all he does is look at me and say, fight the devil, son. And boy, that is the truth, because every step of the way, the devil will try to get in your way, get in your face and stop you. But we will not be overcome by the tricks and the schemes and the devices of the devil. All right. So, so then he says in verse 13, he says, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil. What are we supposed to do? Withstand. And having done all to stand, verse 14 starts with stand. Can't tell you how many times I felt like quitting, giving up. And I would moan and groan and bellyache and walk around my house and complain. And I remember a couple of times I took the towel and said, I'm just throwing this towel in. Chuck the towel in, God would take the towel and just throw it back at me. I said, I'm quitting, I'm giving up. I said, no, you're not. After you've done all to stand, keep on standing. And I'm telling you, guys, we need more of that in the body of Christ, man. Just because you have a little trouble, just because the devil's come to harass you, just because the devil's got in your way, we need some more people. We need some stick to itness in the body of Christ. We, listen, let me tell you, don't lose your fight. Listen to me, don't lose your fight. Get up and fight your battle and fight until you win and you get to the other side. After you've done all to stand, you say, oh, I'm tired, I'm worn out. Stop belly aching and pick yourself up and fight on, brother, and fight on because you will win if you will stick to it. That's why he tells you, after you've done all to stand, keep on standing. Then it goes through all the pieces of the, sh of the armor, and we're not going to get into all of that today, but um, um, I, want to, I want to move on to a couple of verses. I'm just going to read these out because I want you to have a clear understanding that the devil has schemes. Because again, sometimes people don't want to believe this. Sometimes people will fight you. Sometimes they're afraid. But I want you to see. And then we'll get over to weapons. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 13, verse 16 through 17, Jesus heals a woman who was bowed over, had a spirit of infirmity. She was bent over like this. And he does it on a Sabbath day. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious ones, got ticked off because he did it on, a, on, a, on, a, on the Sabbath. But listen to what Jesus' response is to them. He says, so ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, listen, whom Satan hath bound. Think of it. For 18 years be loose from this bond on the Sabbath. Whom Satan hath bound. Satan had some sort of bondage, that sickness and disease. That's why I say sickness and disease is not from God. We also know in, in the book of Acts where it says Jesus went around doing good and healing all those who are oppressed of the devil. So the devil is the author of sickness and disease. He's the one that comes to make you sick. God doesn't make you sick. God is your healer. Jesus said, I come to give you life and to give it to you more abundantly, not to give you sickness and disease and to wipe you out. So we see one of his devices is to bind people up with sickness, with disease, whatever it be. So here in Luke twenty two thirty one, 31, and, and he's having discussion here with, with Simon Peter. And he says, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has come or Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. So the devil is trying to get into the plan of God here. He, he's trying to mess up Peter's life, just like he tries in your life and in my life. And, and Jesus said, but I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. And we know that Peter did deny Jesus. He did. So this is another scheme, another pl uh, plot of the enemy trying to sift us like wheat trying to get us discouraged, try to get us confused, try to get us mixed up, try to get us off course. The enemy always comes to try to sift like wheat. In 2 Corinthians 2.11, um, <clears throat> Paul again refers to Satan. He says, lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. So here we see again that the scriptures are pointing out that the enemy has devices, has plans, has schemes that it has set against God's people. In um, 2 Timothy 2.26, Paul again writes and says, 
and they came, uh, and that they may come to their senses and escape this, and talking about the unsaved, escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. Having been taken captive by him to do his will. So we can see just from these few verses how the enemy has a plan. This goes back to the word while, where it's an orchestrated, organized plot and scheme that he uses against God's people. But we are not unwise. We understand and should understand that the devil is out there lurking and seeking and trying to get into our life. But we, although he may have the devices and he may have the schemes and he may have the plans, we have weapons that we should use against him and can use against him to the destruction of those plans and devices. So I'm not afraid of the devil. I say, devil, get out of my way. Because you start up with me, I'm going to start pulling out my weapons and I'm going to start doing double time with my weapons on you and, and, and you're going to be, so, all right, let's, so let's talk about this. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse three and six. And I'll just read this uh, to you and, and, and Grace will put it up on the screen today. Second Corinthians 10, three and six says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. So let me just say this, this is really important. I've seen a lot of Christians try to fight spiritual battles by natural means. You get all frustrated and get your flesh in it and get... You know, you cannot fight spiritual battles by natural means. The only way spiritual battles are fought are by spiritual means. And that's why you have to know what your weapons are. You have to be ready, willing, and able to use the weapons that God has given you because you will never fight a spiritual battle and win by natural means. You have to use spiritual weapons against the devil. So he says... For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. In other words, the weapons that God has given us is to destroy the schemes, the tricks, the trickery, the craftiness, the devices of the enemy. God says, you have weapons. They're not of this natural world. They are spiritual weapons and they are for the pulling down of strongholds. That means we ought to rip down every stronghold in our life. Doesn't matter what the stronghold is. A stronghold of alcohol, a stronghold of drugs, a stronghold of cigarettes, a stronghold of depression, a stronghold of sexual perversity. Whatever the stronghold is, we have the authority and the weapons to tear it down. To tear it down. A stronghold of sickness, a stronghold of rebellion in your home. We have the authority and the weapons to use it to tear it down. Can I get a better amen than that? All right. First Peter 5, 8 says it this way. He says, be sober and be vigilant because your adversary, your who? adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion he's not a roaring lion but he thinks he is seeking whom he may devour and Peter tells us resist him being steadfast in the faith so what are we supposed to do with the devil we're to resist him all right so let's get into a couple of our weapons for the next few minutes and let's talk about it the weapons of our warfare so the devil has tricks he's got schemes he's got a crafty plan, but we have weapons that can destroy and should destroy. So the very first weapon that I want to talk about today is the weapon of praise. The weapon of praise. All right, let me read the verse here in uh, Psalm 149, five through nine said, let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud on their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand to execute vengeance on the nations and punishments on the people to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron to execute on them the written judgment. This honor have all the saints. Praise the Lord. In other words, God's saying praise is spiritual warfare. Let me tell you what. When you release praises out of your mouth, the devil is rebuked. When you're singing praises to God, you're giving the enemy a headache. He doesn't want to hear it. 
You see, that's why when you, you, you come into a spiritual warfare, sometimes you just don't know what to do. There have been many times I didn't know what to do. I was confused. I prayed all the prayers I knew to pray. The only thing left to do in this spiritual warfare is to just lift up some praise, to lift up some worship, to start glorifying the Lord. And I would just walk around just praising God, singing, worshiping, and giving God the glory. Because when the praises go up, the glory comes down. And in the glory comes the power. And when the power is manifested, chains are broken. Devices and schemes of the enemy are destroyed when you worship and you praise and you glorify God. You see, that's why the devil contends for his place in your life for, for, for the music. You see, the music that we listen to is so important. I'll bet you, but I fill my house with praise and worship. Sometimes I just walk around and just praise him and worship him and glorify him. Sometimes I like to let other people sing for me, but sometimes I just want instrumental. I want to make up my own words. I need to say my own things sometimes. I need to glorify him in my own way. I, I can't listen to somebody else. I need to do it from the depths of my heart. Come on. And that's what gives the devil a headache. Praise, 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 worship. Worship the Lord with all that you've got. I mean, you know, man, sometimes it just got to come from your toes. It just comes, bubbles up. Worship him and praise him. You see, because when you do that, you, you inflict vengeance on the enemy. You bind the enemy when you worship. You see. You remember the story of Paul and Silas when they're locked up in, in stocks in a prison? It was the 11th hour. And there was nothing left to do. You know, I'm going to tell you what, when there's nothing left to do, when you've done all that you can do, just start praising. Just start worshiping. Just start glorifying the Lord with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your might. Just start worshiping and praising and glorifying. So Paul and Silas start worshiping. They start praising. They start singing songs. And all of a sudden, as the praises went up, the glory of God came down. And the building shook. And the chains were loosed. And the stocks were open. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You see, and people got saved. And all kinds of things happened. Because two people... At the 11th hour, when there was nothing left to do, remember, we still have a weapon. We still have a weapon to use in our time of need. Lifted up the praise and lifted up the worship and the glory and the power of God came down. Praise is a weapon. Yeah, I don't understand why more people don't show it. Some people, well, let me, let me say it this way. A lot of you come after the praise and worship. God bless you. I thank you for coming to church. And I know the word is what you want. But brother, sister, you don't understand what you're missing. You don't understand you have an opportunity to get in the congregation of the worship and the praise. Giving the devil a headache. Setting the atmosphere right. Setting your own heart right in the presence of God. So that the word of God can be ministered to you in a powerful way. Because when you worship God, you dismantle. You dismantle the enemy's plan. You dismantle the works of darkness when you praise and you worship. I fill my house with worship and praise. I, I had a system put in where I have speakers almost in every room, not every room, but enough to where I could hear it in every room. And I just have a little iPad with all my music. And sometimes I just got to hit that button and walk around my house and just let that praise music just saturate me as I just worship and pray the blessing of the Lord over my house and over my life and over my family. Just worship and pray. It's, it's a weapon. It's a weapon that we use against the devil. Sometimes you may feel depressed. You may feel down. You say there's, there's you know, I, I, I don't know what to do. Worship. Worship. Just worship. You say, I don't feel like worshiping. Worship anyway. I'm doing it, but I don't feel like doing it. Do it anyhow. I'm doing it, and, and I, I, I'm like rebelling on the inside. Do it even more. Kick the devil in the face even more. See, see, you can't be led by your emotions and by your feelings. I'm going to tell you what. You just start worshiping, even when you don't feel like worshiping. You just start worshiping unto God when it, it just doesn't feel like anything. And you just stay at it. I'm going to tell you, you start out in the flesh. You're going to end up in the spirit. You're going to end up in the spirit. You're going to end up in the spirit. 
You're going to break through the hardness of that moment and you will experience the full glory of God. Trust me, I've been there many times. So praise, praise and worship is a weapon. Now we know this, but we've got to be reminded. The word of God is the most lethal weapon that we possess. Remember when Jesus was confronted in the spiritual warfare that he confronted, and I use that as a model over and over again, because he was about to step into the purpose for which he was sent into this earth. And who does he meet just moments before he's stepping in to the fullness of the plan that God had for him? He meets Satan who comes to harass him, to tempt him, to trick him, to try to get him to bow down. And what does Jesus do? Does he enter into a conversation with the devil? Does he moan and groan and complain about how tired he is and how hungry he is because he's been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights? He doesn't even entertain the devil, but quickly just looks at him and says, it is written, boom, just like that. It is written, boom, it is written, boom. Every time you speak the word of God from your heart to your situation, it's like throwing a grenade right in the midst of that trouble or that problem. He just speaks the word of God and releases the power to dismantle the plan and the purpose of the enemy. That's what turns the devil on his heels when you start to release the word of God from your mouth. That's why you've got to know the word. That's why you've got to memorize the word. That's why you must speak the word. Don't speak about your situation. Speak the word of God to your situation. That's what dismantles the plans and the devices that the enemy has against you. Of course, he's going to come and harass. Sometimes people come to me, and I understand you can get weary in the warfare, but they sit across my desk and they look at me like, you know, like, like this is, I'm the only one in the world. Like they're the only one in the world that's, that's going through this. Say, oh, I don't know, the devil's harassing me, and I've got this. Dear brother, dear sister, join the club. You know, people say, well, you don't know what's going on in my life. Well, you don't know what's going on in my life, or that person's life, or that. We all have junk going on, but praise God, we've got to have a plan of attack against the enemy. Praise the word of God. Let me get back to, let me get back to praise for a minute. Can I just get back for praise? Are you all okay? Am I, am I preaching all right? All right. Let me get back to praise. That's why when you're praising, the words to the songs that you are singing are so important. I filter every, I go through every song that we sing. And I, sometimes I've changed the words. You know, a word here or a word there makes a whole bit of difference. Don't you be singing and belly aching about your problems and your, I mean, I've heard some songs, you know, and the melody is so cool. And I thought, wow, the person singing it is so cool. But the words, I mean, make me want to vomit. They are so devoid of faith and power and good doctrine. That's why we've got to be very careful what we're singing. Make sure that you're singing the word of God. I love the songs that have their, their basis and their, their, you know, the fullness in the word of God and it's faith inspiring. That's what I want to do. So the word worship, the word, let me give you a couple of verses. Hebrews 4 12 says the word of God is active and living and sharper than any two edged sword, sharper than any two edged sword. That means it has power to dismantle, to divide up, to cut up the schemes, the chains, the shackles, the plans, and the purposes of the enemy, sharper than a two-edged sword. That's what the word of God is. In 1 John 2, 14, John writing, he says to the, to the older men and the younger men, he says, I have written to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning. I have written to you young men because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the wicked one. How did, he, how did they overcome the wicked one? By the word of God that was in them. That's why, folks, keep the word close to your heart. Treasure the word of God, not the doctrines of man. There are a lot of doctrines of man that go around. Don't, don't, don't fall for the doctrine. Test everything against the word of God. Don't just 
swallow it because it sounds good. Test it against the word of God and then hold it dear and near to your heart because it has life and it is powerful and it is sharper than any two-edged sword to the dividing asunder, to the ripping apart. I'll put it this way. This is just Pastor Ray's translation. It has the power to dismantle, to disrupt, and to undo the works of darkness and the schemes and the plans of the enemy. We should never be afraid of the devil. In Ephesians, where it gives us all the parts we just read, gives you all the parts of the armor. But notice there's one part that was never given to us, and that was a covering for our back. Why? Because we're never to turn and run from the devil. We're to run toward him. We've got all the protection, and we even have a shield of faith that quenches all of his fiery darts, and we have the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Come on, somebody give me a better amen than that. All right. Weapon number three that we want to talk about for a minute is plain old prayer. Just prayer. The Bible says in James 5, 16, the effective and fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. That means prayer that comes from the depths of your heart. Prayer that you mean. You put your whole self into it. Not just a flippant little, hi God, nice to... Nice to talk to you today. Bless me. Bless my house. Bless my kids. Thank you. The effectual and heartfelt, fervent prayer. That means we've got to put some time into it. Concentration into it. It means that we've got to have a little focus time in prayer. He said that kind of prayer of a righteous man and that means you and me because we're not righteous in our own and of our own. But we are the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. It's Jesus who made you and me righteous. So we qualify for this scripture, for the benefits of this scripture. It says the effective and fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. I like to say it this way. Prayer changes things. As much as you don't want to think so, prayer changes things. I, I use this illustration a couple of weeks ago because I preached these, some of this a few weeks ago. And Samuel's here today to testify. Stand up, Samuel. Just stand up for a minute. Just praise God. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You could be seated. Samuel, Samuel and Mirabel have a very powerful ministry. Am I okay telling this? Am I okay telling this? Samuel and Mirabel have a very strong ministry in Cameroon, Africa. And they are missionaries. We support them. We love them. We pray for them. Mirabel was here with her daughter. Many of you know this story, but I'll, for the sake of those that don't know. Mirabel was here with her daughter, who, uh, Nina, who just had given birth. And Samuel was there taking care of things in Cameroon. And there's a lot, of, a lot of ugly stuff going on there. I don't have time to get into it, but Samuel was kidnapped. Now, Samuel, forgive me if I hack this story up a little bit, but I think I've got the gist of it. In the days that he was in capture, Mirabel called me. I sent out an email to all of you. Let's pray. Because I believe that prayer can change things and can destroy the works of darkness. This is the devil trying to thwart the plans that God has put in their heart for Cameroon, Africa. This is the plan of the enemy to try to snuff out the man of God and the woman of God. He said while he was captive, they, they sat, I guess they were sitting on the floor, whatever it be, and they would come around with a club and they started beating the bottom of everybody's feet just to torture them. And Samuel said he would, the guy would just get just like a guy or two before him and he would stop. Am I telling it right? And this happened for a couple of days in succession. He said, just like that. It's like they never laid a hand on me. Now, now you can't convince me 
that this wasn't as a result of prayer, that this church and all the other people around the country and all the other were praying in his behalf. That God sent deliverance on this man and saved him, got him safely out of that situation, and now he's here for whatever time he can be. I'm trying to convince him to stay, but their, their heart is in Cameroon. But it was prayer. Prayer changes things. Prayer brings deliverance. Prayer is a mighty weapon that you and I have. The devil has a scheme, but we've got weapons of our warfare to use against him to break and to destroy and to dismantle the plans of the enemy. Weapons of our warfare. Prayer. Dear God, don't ever discount. You may say, but I'm praying and nothing is happening. Let me tell you what. I, 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 I refer to a verse and I don't have time to get to it. It's in the book of Daniel where Daniel prayed. And the angel comes to him and says, Daniel, he said, the moment you prayed, your prayer entered up and reached heaven. He said, but there was a, the prince of Persia withstood me for 21 days. In other words, it took a spiritual battle of 21 days for the angel to break through and to bring the answer that Daniel was seeking. You see, that just gives us a picture of what's going on in the heavenlies or in the, in the, in the spirit realm that you and I don't see. Sometimes you're praying, but there's a battle ensuing. There's something going on behind the scenes that we're not aware of, but God, the more that prayer goes up and the more we just hold fast our, our prayer, and of course, this is a prayer of faith, right? We're not praying the same old doubting prayer over and over again. We're praying and now we're thanking. Once we prayed, we asked God for something, we're thanking him, worshiping him. It becomes a prayer of thanksgiving unto God. Am I speaking to anybody here? Prayer is a weapon and it will bring great deliverance. All right, I got to go quickly. We're running out of time here. Here's a weapon, the name of Jesus. <laughs> I don't know. Been, like I said, there've been times, like I, I told a story um, to the other group that some years ago I was driving home from, uh, from work from here and um, at the corner where near my house, I, it's a main intersection. And I usually like go over the stop line and really get close up to the corner because I want to just go, you know, when the light turns, you know, it's not me, it's the car, you know, it's just fast. But anyway, this particular day I stopped well beyond the, the line and I just said, you know, I guess I felt it was a good idea to just stop be before the line. And within 15 seconds of stopping, two cars collide. I guess a guy was trying to make a, a woman was trying to make a left and it was another woman they collided and the cars are like, it looked like they were spinning, but they were all of a sudden being pushed right towards me and I'm holding my steering wheel and I didn't have time to refer to a verse or to open my Bible or open up my Bible app. All I did is say, Jesus! And all of a sudden, the two cars stopped, literally inches before my, the front, front end of my car inches. I mean, you could have put your hand in there. And I just, very nicely, it was right by a firehouse. So these firemen come running out. So I figured they don't need me. I was like, see you later. I just backed my car up. Bye. And I turned around and I took off. <laughs> and I said, thank you, Jesus. You see, that, that teacher said, the power that's in the name of Jesus. Sometimes you don't know what to do. Sometimes you don't have the answer. Sometimes you don't have time to think of a prayer. Oh, but let me tell you what, the name of Jesus, when you start to invoke and release the name of Jesus. You see, you see here, here, it says in, in Acts 3, 1, 8, you remember when, uh, uh, Peter, you came across the, 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 the man that was at the gate beautiful and he was lame from his mother's womb and he asked for silver and he said, look, I don't have silver or gold, but what I have, I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And with those words, he takes him by the hand and strength comes back to the man and he's leaping and jumping and worshiping and praising and thanking God. It's the name of Jesus. It's the name that is above every name, that at the sound of the name of Jesus, everything in the heavens, everything on the earth, and everything beneath the earth must bow. Come on, put your hands together and give him praise. Must bow. 
the name of Jesus. Don't discount the authority that sickness and disease responds to the name of Jesus. Depression, sadness responds to the name of Jesus. Whenever you pray, you better pray in the name of Jesus. He taught us to pray in his name. Anything you ask in my name, it will be given to you or it will be done for you. It is the name that bears the authority. Can I get a better amen than that? See, in, in Mark's gospel, chapter 16, Jesus said, these signs will follow them that believe. What did he say? In my name, you will cast out demons. The devil knows the name of Jesus. That's why you have authority and power, the authority to use and the power that's invested in the name. So that's a weapon. You got to use it. Got to use it. Number five, I'm almost finished. Two and I'll be done. The blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus is a weapon. Oh, yes. Let me tell you what. We could talk about it from many, many perspectives, but I'll, I'll approach it from this perspective because I think this deals with most of us. Is that many times we, you know, we fail. We, we don't see, seek to fail. We don't seek to make mistakes. We don't seek to sin sometimes. But the truth of the matter is we, we do. We're human. We're never going to be perfect. Now, I'm not saying that we should pursue this or, or this should be, you know, something we just excuse away. But the fact of the matter is people make mistakes. Good people who love God and fear God make big mistakes. But thank God that we have the blood of Jesus that forgives us and cleanses us. Because see what happens when you make a mistake, when you sin, when you fall short, the enemy is on your back calling you a sinner, calling you all kinds of names, telling you that you're not worthy, that your prayers are never going to get answered, that your faith isn't going to work, that this isn't going to happen because of this, because of that. He's an acute, called the accuser of the brethren. Thank God that we've got the blood of Jesus. Thank God that the blood of Jesus cleansed us 2,000 years ago and still to this day cleanses us every single time we screw up and we make a mistake in our life. That's a weapon that you have to use against the devil. The devil may be bringing condemnation. You come up with the blood of Jesus. You say, thank you, that the blood of Jesus cleanses me from all unrighteousness and restores my place and restores that sense of righteousness in my life. Thank God the blood of Jesus is a weapon. Otherwise, the devil would, have, would win that war in our lives. Not going to win it. Not going to win that war. Amen? Amen? So the blood of Jesus. 1 John 1, 7 says the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And this will be the last one we'll finish right here. Faith. You ought to go back and read chapter 11 of the book of Hebrews by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith. All of the wonderful, miraculous things that God's people did by faith. Man, listen, you, look, look, whatever it is, like God told me this years ago, because, you know, I got to thinking, you know, oh, it's getting tough. It's getting hard. This was hard. This wasn't easy. And God said, look, son, you're going to have to get used to it. You're called to walk by faith. So there are going to be challenges but you have enough faith to overcome those challenges. You have enough faith to bring in what you need, to, to, to bring in the resources, to bring in the money, to bring whatever it is. You have enough faith to do it. You're, you've been called to walk by faith. So guess what? Turn the sight off. Stop looking and complaining. Start closing your eyes and walking. Oh, I thought that was a good place to give me a better amen than that. <laughs> faith. Faith is a weapon. It's a weapon. It's a weapon. When you start using your faith, the devil is rebuked. His plans are dismantled because my faith is going to bust right through it. I've had to use my faith to bust through some of the most difficult circumstances, but you use your faith. So these are just some of the weapons that we have highlighted today. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what the devil brings. You've got the victory through Jesus Christ. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. He's got devices, plans and schemes, but we have weapons. Come on, put your hands together and give him praise and glory in the house of God.